Okay, so uh, I wanted to speak some more about this topic of proving approximation guarantees for game theoretic equilibria. And uh, so I'm going to start by just you know, reminding you where we left off, where, where the story was last time when we were talking about games of incomplete information and extension theorems for Bayes-Nash equilibria. I'll also fill in a couple of the missing details just because they're so simple. I want you to see how simple they are. Then we're going to move on to part three, which is where we study composition theorems. So this is how you extend price of anarchy bounds from simple mechanisms, like say a single item auction, to a more complex one, like a bunch of single item auctions running in parallel. And then whatever time I have left at the end, I'll talk about a new very powerful approach for proving lower bounds on the price of anarchy, which leverages uh, computational communication complexity in lieu of explicit constructions. All right. So. Remember the sort of extension theorem approach to proving uh, price of anarchy bounds for you know, uh, general sets of equilibria. So you start, you think about, okay, what do I want my theorem to say? What do I want my guarantee to be about? And at the moment, we're thinking about auctions. So we're thinking about games of incomplete information. We should be thinking about Bayes-Nash equilibria. Bayes-Nash equilibria depend on the prior. What's the prior? Well, who knows? So we really like Bayes-Nash equilibria guarantees for arbitrary prior distributions, right? That's what we want our theorem to say. So we put that in the right box, and then we say, well, what would we be much happier actually just establishing, actually being tasked with proving? And in this case, we're going to use complete information games. So think as if you uh, instantiated everybody's private valuations and made them common knowledge, and you just look at pure Nash equilibria. And the goal of an extension theorem is to take whatever bound you prove in this very, very special case and extend that exact same approximation bound to the much more general situation you actually care about. So we went through this in detail in complete information games yesterday. I also introduced the how to modify it to handle games of incomplete information. But let me remind you how it goes. So think it, for the moment, just think about like a, a first price auction, single item first price auction. So you fix a setting. And remember, we, wanna, we, we really want to do our analysis in a complete information setting. So we actually fix the valuations. Okay? So it's sort, of a, it's sort of weird, but it's just for the analysis only. It's like a first price auction with commonly known valuations. Now the rest proceeds as it did before. You choose some baseline strategies. Okay, so I was calling these S star mostly yesterday. Now they're B star because they're bids. These should correspond to some optimal outcome. And then it should be the case that uniformly across all of their outcomes, i.e. all of their bid profiles B, there is some disentangling inequality which holds. Okay? And so we had one last time, and this is the one we're using right now. So it just says if you look at this entangled version of the bid profiles B and B star, you look at the utilities earned by the deviators, right after a deviator deviates to its baseline strategy, you should be able to lower bound the sum of the deviator's utilities by a suitable linear combination of the two things we actually care about. Actually, there's a little bit of a tweak. So you might have expected welfare here from yesterday, if you reason by analogy, but it's a good optimization to write revenue instead. Okay, so we take this number that we don't care about and relate it to two numbers that we do care about. Uh, mu is just set to one. Lambda is going to be less than one. The closer this is to one, the better, the stronger the guarantee. Okay. And then what's going to be true is that whenever you prove an inequality like this about your game, so this is the step where you have to understand your game. Okay? The parameter lambda will be different for different games. Okay? And if your game is special, maybe you have a nice lambda, close to one. What's independent of the game is going to be the extension theorem. Okay? So whatever your game is, whatever your lambda is, if you prove a guarantee through this inequality, you will automatically get a guarantee of lambda on the Bayes-Nash price of anarchy for a worst case prior distribution. Okay? So that's the paradigm. So you first understand special, you, know, you establish this for a fixed game, then you use the machinery to extend it. Now, again, for a definition to be interesting, you should demand examples, you should demand implications. And I went through this very quickly last time, but I want to show you the actual the proofs. So uh, there's many examples, but I'm going to focus on the example of a first price auction. And I'm going to prove to you this inequality with a uh, lambda of 1 half. And then I'm actually going to prove to you the extension theorem. Okay, so last time we saw an extension theorem for no regret sequences. Here we're going to see an extension theorem for Bayes-Nash equilibria. All right. All right, so I just rewrote that smoothness inequality again. Okay, so the claim is that the smoothness inequality holds for a first price auction with lambda equal to one half. Yeah. Uh, if you could go back one slide. Mm -hmm. uh, when you choose the baseline B star, uh, can it be like arbitrary or does like each person's B star depend only on his valuation or something like that? Excellent question. At the moment, I'm being intentionally um, and sort of noncommittal about it. Okay, so at the moment, just you choose B star. Okay, and I'll show you in the first price auction. I'll show you exactly how I set B star. So I think the right thing to do is, basically, the next slide B star is just going to be bid half your value. Okay, so that'll be B, that'll be B star. 
Right. So, so let me prove to you for a first price auction that it, that it satisfies an inequality. Now, remember, the, the order of quantifiers gets a little tricky here. Okay, so let's keep them in mind. No matter, so we fix an arbitrary valuation profile. Okay, so for every V, there should exist baseline strategies B star, so that for every other bid profile B, this inequality holds. Okay, for every valuations V, there exists B star, so that for every B, this is true. Okay. So, but this is the whole proof. The proof is like trivial. Okay, so this is like the one time where we actually think about a first price auction. Everything else is just kind of black box. And all we have to think about with the first price auction is the following totally trivial argument. Okay? So why is this true? Okay, so obviously the issue is like, okay, what are the B stars? Okay? B stars are very simple. Okay, so you fix your arbitrary valuations, V1 through Vn. We're just going to set the baseline strategy for bidder I to be to bid half your value. Okay? So Vi over 2. That's it. Those are the B stars. Okay? So this is a really nice trick, actually. You're not, I'm not going to be able to really show you this again in the talk, but this bid half your value is a really nice trick. It shows up all the time over the past few years. Okay? So, what, so think about a first price auction. So notice each term on the left-hand side. So this is the utility earned by some bidder, I, after it bids half its value. Okay? Two things can happen in a first price auction if you bid half your value. You could lose, utility zero. You could win, utility half your value because right? you pay your bid. Only two things that could happen. So you never get non-negative utility. It's either zero or half your value. So this is non-negative. So this is trivial unless the right-hand side is positive. Yeah? Otherwise, there's nothing to prove because the left-hand side is definitely non-negative. So assume that, in fact, you know, half the opt welfare is strictly bigger than the revenue of this arbitrary bid profile B. Okay? So it's a single-item auction. So what is opt welfare? Opt welfare is just the biggest valuation. Okay? Let's call it bidder number one. Okay? This is the one part I'll use as a first price auction and not say a second price auction. What's the revenue on a given bid profile B? It's just the highest bid. Okay? Because that's who wins and you charge the bid. All right? So saying that the right hand side is strictly positive is the same as saying that half of the highest value is at least the highest bid in this bid vector B. Okay? Okay, well, under this assumption, let's think about the high value bidder, say bidder number one. What happens to bidder one? when everybody else bids according to B, and bidder one bids half its value? Well, it wins, right? So under our assumption, half of the highest value is bigger than all of the bids in B. So in the very first term in this sum, when bidder one, the high value bidder, bids half its value, it wins. Therefore, it gets value V over two, okay? Which is also at least the right-hand side, okay? So it's even at least the right-hand side without the minus revenue term. So that's it. You know, it's kind of a, it's maybe, maybe it's, you know, it's a clever setup of the case analysis, but it's literally two lines. We will never need to think about the details of first price auctions ever again in the rest of the talk. Okay? Even to handle simultaneous compositions and so on. Okay, so I mentioned this last time, but it, you can be a little bit more clever than just bidding half your value. You can bid a distribution over uh, possible bids, and you can improve this 50% to 63%. Okay, so I'm not going to show you that. Now that I've told you that, you're all totally capable of working it out as a homework problem. It can be done. Okay, so you can do 63% if you want. Questions? Um, how do I think about the difference between 50% and 63%? Um, I, I'm trying to think of a um, non silly answer to that question. So, I mean, what would be... Uh, well, people obviously care about making these numbers bigger. So, yes. So, bigger is better. Is there anything else to say? I mean, or put it differently. What, <laughs> what possible motivation for yep. this? Yep. The reason people use auctions is because the price of energy found is, quote, good, unquote. Yep. If that's the argument, would 50% have been good enough to make that? Does it matter if it is 63? If it had been a quarter, would that have been good enough? Good. So, let that if one wanted to convince an economics audience of what was, you know, how to do this discussion is important, but it doesn't happen yet. Sure. No, now I understand what you're asking. So I'd say there's two different things to distinguish. One would be, are you trying to make a comparison between two different auctions, and one are you trying to just analyze a single auction? Now, your question, I think, is more pertinent to the former question, which is, you know, if you have one auction with a, you know, worst case price of energy of 0.5 and the other is 0.6, you know, how confidently can you say you should use the 0.6 auction? Yeah, I mean, I think it's not, you'd have to do some experimentation to have 
confidence in that. I think what, you know, what the approximation lens tends to be good for is drawing coarser distinctions, and we'll see an example later today where you know, there'll be one setting where you get reasonable constant factor approximations, and then there are other settings where you get literally nothing. You could just have arbitrarily bad welfare. So it's almost like a zero versus non-zero comparison. That, I think, is relevant for comparing options, just even sort of straight out of the box. Now, here, as far as this optimization, I just want to point out, you know, we've, I've, I've just fixed a math question, right? There's, there's actually, there's nothing, right? So really just as, as analysts, it's our responsibility to prove whatever the truth is. And so I claim that, you know, going from 50 to 63 with a fixed auction format is just, you know, something you'd want to know. You just want to know a type bound for a given auction format. Is that just a bound that's not zero? Then if you prove point zero one, we could declare victory and go home and say, well, yes, we can improve it, but we don't care. Yeah, I, I mean, I would like the strongest true statement possible. Maybe it's just an aesthetic thing. But uh, that's, so I would argue that, you know, I would really like to know that for, for a fundamental auction format, like a first price auction, I actually want to just you know, know the truth of what the right answer is mathematically. I get, the interpretation question is very important, but I think that comes in more when you're like, okay, if you start thinking about making a decision, how does this inform our decision making? And I think it's an excellent question. And so there, I think it's only the coarser comparisons that are, that are relevant. I think an answer is somebody will optimize, so it might as well be me, you know, so. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess, I guess the, one point you're saying there about, say, 1% versus 50% versus 50 is let's suppose it would take you 100 pages of proof to go from a 1% proof, which was maybe two lines like you just did, to a 50%, which is then 100 pages. Then is it important for a theorist like yourself to spend that amount of time writing this 100 page proof down? And I think you'd probably say no, like you wouldn't bother to do that. Yeah, there's some cost-benefit analysis about how much better the theorem gets versus the opportunity cost where you could have been proving more interesting theorems. I agree. In this case, in, in, where is this going? In, yeah, exactly. In this case, Vasilis's trick is very simple, so it's absolutely worth going from the 50 to 60, 50 to 63. Exactly. Okay. Well, I'm going to move on. So, yeah. I think the issue is somewhat different. The price of anarchy is telling you what's the worst amount you could lose as compared to doing the best possible. And the tighter band you can get on that, it seems to me the better it is. I don't, so, of course the stronger theorem implies the weaker theorem, but, 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 but if, the question is what is the theorem good for? It has to help us think about this, this institution. And so, one answer seems to be what matters for that question is whether it's zero or not, and then it's just a stronger math result than for numbers, or a different view is it actually matters, you know, for some um, normative or predictive question what the number is. And I was trying, to, I was agnostic to whether that was the case. I was trying to have some discussion about about what was the numbers. Well, of course, stronger theorems are stronger than weaker theorems. But I mean, I'm not thinking of this as a theorem at all. I mean, of course, it is a theorem, but I, I'm not proving a better number just to get a better theorem. I... So one other, one, other, one other thing I'll say, and then, then I'd like to move on, would be if you really nail the, um, if, you, if, you get, if you have the tight analysis, it almost always as a byproduct gives you an understanding of what the worst case examples look like. So, you know, in particular here, you can ask, okay, if 63% is the best possible, what matches that? And then you often look at those instances and you see, you can, and then one of two things happens. Either you see features that are actually relevant to the real world, so the non-pathological instances, and then you're like, oh, okay, this tells, give me some advice about when this auction format, say, will perform close to this worst case. Actually, more common, you're like, oh, those are the bad examples? Those are stupid. And then you go back and you say, say, okay, what do I mean stupid? So what do I mean by a real instance? And you sort of sharpen your definition of which instances you care about, and then hopefully you can prove better approximation bounds. So you can also regard it as kind of the opening foray of a back and forth between kind of the instances you care about and the worst case approximations you want to prove. So, all right, so let me move on to the extension theorem. All right, so we now have an example. So you really can establish this inequality, at least for first price auctions. Like I said, there's many other examples. I won't have time to talk about them. Why should you care? You should care because you automatically get Bayes-Nash price of anarchy bounds for, for worst case uh, prior distributions. All right, so assume we've proved this. This is what we just proved for the first price auction with lambda equal to half. Let me warm up with a totally uninteresting statement, okay, which is just to say at least the pure price of anarchy is gamma or better, lambda or better, excuse me, 
Okay? So suppose this is true. I claim that, you know, if there's a pure Nash equilibrium, it has at least a lambda fraction of the optimal welfare. So pick your favorite pure Nash equilibrium, okay, B. This is what we want to lower bound. We want to say the welfare is high, okay? So the welfare splits into just the revenue to the seller plus the sum of the player utilities, just by definition. So now we invoke the Nash equilibrium hypothesis. If any bidder switches to any other bid holding everyone else fixed, its utility only drops. In particular, if it switches to a baseline strategy, B star I, the utility only goes down. By our assumption, we can disentangle that entangled term and charge it against lambda times the optimal welfare minus the revenue of the bid vector B. The two revenue terms cancel, and we're just left with lambda times the optimal welfare. Okay, so it's almost immediate. Okay? So pure Nash equilibria, fine. Okay, but that was sort of the point. Remember, remember the extension theorem mindset. You prove something easy, like this, then you just apply a black box to extend it to base Nash equilibria. Actually, here the extension theorem is just as easy as this argument. Okay? So how do you change this so that it applies to Bayes' Nash equilibria? Well, so there's going to be some prior, but fix an arbitrary prior. This is going to turn into a Bayes' Nash equilibrium. So remember what that means. Instead of bids, these will be bidding functions mapping values to bids. And then in here, we'll just take expectation over this arbitrary prior of the valuations. Okay? Boom. So this is what you get. All right? So it's the exact same hypothesis. Haven't changed the hypothesis. Much stronger statement. Arbitrary prior distribution. Bayes' Nash price of anarchy. Lambda or better. This is a Bayes' Nash equilibrium. The parentheses just remind you it's a bidding function, not a bid. And then I just added expectations over the, over the distribution throughout. Okay? So we average over the valuations. We look at the bids that uh, are used when those are the valuation profiles, and so on and so forth. Okay? Exact same computation. So there's a subtle point which was asked about earlier, but I'll get back to that in a little bit. All right? But so that's your, that's, your, that's your extension theorem. If you establish this inequality, you actually get a lambda for Bayes' Nash equilibrium, even for correlated valuation distributions. All right, so I wanted to next move on to composition theorems. Are there any questions before I do that? Mm -hmm. Does regret minimization pay out in Bayes' Nash? Yeah, so there's a, there's a new paper, actually, by Jason and Vasilis and Eva that handles this. So they're the ones to ask about that. So there are, ba basically you can, as my understanding is you can combine, you can have both. So you can have sort of easily learned and complete information uh, bounds that basically obey the same kind of guarantees. But I ask, ask Ava, Vasilis, and Jason for more. Other questions? So a lot of stuff I can talk about, uh, more applications of this specific smoothness guarantee, uh, different versions of the smoothness for critical bid or second price type rules, um, some inter interesting interpretations in terms of revenue covering, which actually allows you to estimate empirically the price of anarchy in real auctions from data, which I think is very cool. Um, even extensions of this to dynamic environments where you have bidders churning. Okay, so there's been a lot going on that I don't have time to talk about. Instead, I want to, again, really what, you know, my foremost goal here is to just show you the toolbox, okay, to, to convince you that actually you can build up really general statements from just a lot of really simple to assemble pieces. So this next thing is going to be one of those, uh, you know, tools, which is reducing complex mechanisms to simple ones. So I've only talked about single item auctions so far. Suppose you had many items, different items, okay? Now, when you only have one item, it's very easy to understand you know, what a bidder wants. There's just this single dimensional valuation. What's it's willing to pay for the one item? You start scaling the number of items M, and bidders can start having very complex preferences. Right? So in principle, a bidder could have a different value for each of the two to the M subsets of items it could get. Okay? So the valuation is blowing up exponentially in the number of items. Now, one thing that makes combinatorial auctions, these multi-item auctions, such a sort of productive theoretical playground is you can get lots of different types of problems, welfare maximization problems, by varying the allowable valuations. Okay? So you can draw diagrams like this. There's many other sets I haven't written. So you could have general valuations where any bidder could have any value for any subset, maybe monotone, say. Or you can impose restrictions, which, of course, only makes the problem easier, should only make your approximation guarantee is better. Okay, so submodular, this is what I mentioned on the very first representative result yesterday. For now, I'm going to just, for the talk, I'm going to focus on unit demand valuations, although all the results from this part are more general. Okay, the results from this part hold basically somewhere between these third and fourth bubbles. Okay, so more general than submodular. What's a unit demand valuation? That means each bidder only wants one thing. Okay, so it can have preferences among the different things. 
right? So as a bitter I, I have VIJs for each item J, but if you give me lots of items, I basically just throw out all of the ones except the one I like the most, okay? So formally, your value for a bundle is just the maximum of your item values, okay? So that's a unit demand valuation. Now, you know, if you wanted, with unit demand valuations, you could just run the VCG mechanism and it would be fine. It's just a bipartite matching problem, okay? But suppose actually you wanted to do something even simpler than bipartite matching. Suppose you wanted to sell these M items separately in parallel, okay, simultaneously using single item auctions. Let's say first price auctions, okay? What would happen, this is obviously something you could do, right? You could, again, just put a bunch of goods up for sale on eBay, something like that, see what happens. Would this work well? Let's say with bidders have unit demand valuations. Right? Not obvious, a priori, I claim at all, whether this would have any kind of interesting guarantee or not. And actually, I want you to, so just think about composing first price auctions, although the, you, know, you can define this generally. You have a bunch of mechanisms, you can think about the simultaneous composition, this just means you play them all in parallel, okay? So you choose a bid for each of the constituent mechanisms. What you win at the end is the union of what you win from the constituent mechanisms. What you pay is the sum of your payments from the constituent mechanisms, okay? Don't forget that. So, as a result, say you're a unit demand bidder, okay? And suppose you have the same value for every item, okay? There are these 20 auctions, you want to win one of them, and you get value one, okay, if you win one item. You still have value only one if you win two, okay? So you don't want more than one. What kind of bid, so you get to submit 20 bids, okay, a bid in each of these auctions. What should you do? And notice it's kind of not, it's not an easy question, right? So one thing you could do is you could go all in, you know, on like item 17. You know, you could bid like, you know, 0.9 on item 17 to make sure that you have a really good chance of winning it. Or you could be a bargain hunter and bid like 0.1 on a whole bunch of them, hoping that one of them has like basically no competition. And can you get something at a bargain? But the worry is that, you know, if you try to bid in more than one, you'll win more than one. You pay for both or all of them, but you only get value from one, okay? So it's really not obvious what you should do as a unit demand bidder in simultaneous first price auction, say, okay? And so equilibria are not that easy to understand. But as we've seen, we'll still be able to prove theorems about the equilibria, even though we don't really understand them. Okay, so here's the composition theorem uh, I want to tell you about, which says, suppose your constituent me mechanisms are lambda smooth in the sense we've been discussing. So first price auction is one half smooth. Then, with unit demand valuations, smoothness is preserved under composition. So take any lambda smooth single item auctions, run any number of them that you want in parallel, bidders with unit demand valuations, then this parallel composition is again lambda smooth with exactly the same lambda. Okay? So composition preserves smoothness, right? Or if you like, this reduces having to prove anything about the comp composed mechanism to merely proving something about one of the single item auctions, which we did on three lines. It's pretty cool, okay? So that's the theorem, okay? And again, it's, I, I'm sticking with unit demand for simplicity, but it holds more generally, okay? For, so, this is still true for submodular valuations. It's even true for so-called XOS valuations, for those of you that know what that means, okay? But let's just stick with unit demand for simplicity. So the proof is actually very elegant. Uh, I'm not gonna do it in detail, but I'll, I'll tell you the key idea, because actually the idea is gonna be important for a subtlety later. Remember what it means to prove that something's smooth. Okay, again, there's all these quantifiers, so it's easy to get confused. What do you have to prove? You have to prove that no matter what the valuation profile is, you can choose baseline strategies such that this inequality holds for all bid profiles B. So the hypothesis is that the single item auction is smooth. Okay, so in a single item auction, everything's single dimensional. So that would say for every value, for every profile of one dimensional valuations, there's, a, there's baseline strategies, which are one dimensional bids, so that for every one dimensional bid vector B, this holds. What do we have to prove? We have to prove the analogous inequality for the composed mechanism, where there's M single item auctions. So now we have to prove that for every valuation profile, where now a valuation is M dimensional, where M is the number of items, for every M dimensional valuation profile, we can choose baseline strategies. Again, each of those is going to be an M dimensional bid vector, so that for every bid strategy, every bid profile B, again, M dimensional, this inequality holds, all right? So that's what we have to prove, all right? So how do you do that? Well, we're gonna solve the problem of, in effect, this is only an analysis. We're not like, you know, actually modeling behavior or sort of telling people what to do, but for the analysis, we basically think of solving this problem of how should a unit demand bid or bid, okay, in, a, in, in these auctions, which is you should go all in, or not quite all in, but you should bid half your value on some item, okay, and zero on everything else. That's what the baseline strategies are going to be. 
So the question then is, you know, bidder 17, which of the various items is its baseline strategy going to be to go all in in? And the trick here is you say, well, look at what happens in the optimal solution. Uh, again, keep in mind, it's easy to get confused. This is all just in the analysis. All, we're just doing a proof of an approximation guarantee for equilibria. But I'm going to use the language of algorithms, okay, in the proof. So there's some optimal matching, okay, the unit demand bidders, okay, so the optimal solutions are matching, each bidder gets one or zero goods, okay. If bidder I gets good J in the optimal solution, then its baseline strategy is to bid half its value on good J and zero everywhere else, okay. So that's the definition of the B stars, okay. You fix the valuation profile, what's the B star, look at opt, each bidder bids half its value on whatever item it gets an opt. Remember, opt depends on the values, right? You can't talk about welfare without fixing the values, all right? But you fix the values, then you choose these baseline strategies, half your, half your value on the good you get an opt, and that's it, okay? And basically, everything relevant is additive, okay? So you literally just add up the single item inequalities, you get the desired inequality uh, for the composed mechanism. Okay, I'm going to omit it, but it's really, it kind of writes itself once you have it set up properly. Okay, it's very nice. And again, it works more generally than unit demand. Okay, so any questions about that? So again, this is the key point. Okay? Simultaneous composition preserves smoothness. Yeah. So, I mean, kind of relates to what I asked earlier. Then maybe you should, maybe you should wait, because the whole next five minutes is about that issue, okay. actually. Cool. Yeah, but thanks. So you're, you're very on top of it. So it would seem that we've proven the following theorem, assembling all of the different parts of our toolbox together, okay? So what did we do? Well, we started with a first price auction. We had a two-line argument that said it's smooth with parameter lambda, okay? We just proved this composition theorem. So this says that simultaneous first price auctions are also smooth with parameter one-half, okay? Then we have our extension theorem, which says, oh, well, if you're smooth with parameter one-half, that means the base, the base, the for every prior distribution, even correlated distributions, the Bayes Nash price of anarchy is within a factor two, okay? or a factor one half. Right? It seems like this is what's true based on everything I've told you. Okay? Again, you, the, one, the one thing you have to do from scratch is the first price auction, then you do the composition theorem, then you do the extension theorem. Okay? So why, why does it say first try? Well, there's actually, there's, there's, if you, I don't expect you to remember, but on the very first slide yesterday, when I stated a representative result, it was actually not as strong as what's on this slide. Okay, there was, so, there was sort of a, so it was a less general result that I started out with. And the reason is this is actually false, okay? This statement here. Everything I told you about first price auctions was true. Okay, so the guarantee for worst case correlated valuation distributions for first price auctions, that was correct. But we're missing something subtle in the extension to multiple items. Okay, so there's actually a counter example which says there are distributions over unit demand valuations, there's super correlated valuation distributions, but there are valuation distributions over unit demands, so that every Bayes-Nash equilibrium is terrible, okay? Arbitrarily far from optimal, right? So it's definitely not a factor one half for a worst case correlated uh, prior distribution, okay? So two pieces of good news. The first piece of good news is that a slightly weaker statement is true. And the second piece of good news is that the reason it's true is the sort of same as the reasoning that I've already been explaining to you. So what's going to be true is that for every product distribution of evaluations, that is assuming the valuations are drawn independently, not necessarily identically, but it has to be independent, and that counterexample shows this is necessary, as long as the valuations are drawn from independently from unit demand distributions, then no matter what those distributions are, no matter what Bayes-Nash equilibrium you look at, that's when you get this guarantee of 50% or 63% if you like, okay? Why is this true? Well, the first two steps are exactly what I said. Okay, they're exactly what I've taught you with no modification. You analyze a single item auction just in the full information case in isolation, you prove that one half. The composition theorem was just correct the way I stated it. Okay, so it's just true that simultaneous first price auctions are also smooth with parameter one half. The bug was in the extension theorem, okay, and how I applied it, and it was exactly uh, you know, the question that was getting at the issue. Okay, and it's a subtle issue, but it's important, so that's what I'm going to drill down on next, okay? So I want to explain, so we're going to need to modify the extension theorem. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to show you why the previous one isn't valid, it, why it is valid for first price auctions, but not valid for simultaneous first price auctions, how this gets modified, and why that relaxes the, the, the sort of the conclusion from arbitrary to product distributions. Um, for the single item case, it's also kind of giving you a prescription. Bidding a half is a good idea. But computationally, this isn't, how would you even 
figure out what you should do? So it's a, it's a little, I mean, even, you know, it's a little tricky, that interpretation. Uh, I'm, hes I, I'm hesitant to interpret the bid half your value as that prescriptive. It's sort of prescriptive if you want, like, the aggregate welfare to be good. Right, so if you, if you kind of want to do your part to everybody enjoying a high welfare guarantee, then it is, it is prescriptive. In an individual sense, I, I'm not so comfortable interpreting it as prescriptive. You're right that, I mean, what's interesting about it is, uh, you know, when you do a byproduct of, this, of all the smoothness machinery is, you know, in addition to all of the flavors of equilibrium we've been discussing so far, these bounds hold more generally for, like, any outcome in which every player is doing at least as well as its baseline strategy. Right, so, which is a much weaker than the equilibrium. E equilibrium says you're doing better than every other strategy. Uh, so no, but there'll be a fix where you can. In the first price auction, you could, right? And I'll show you a fix where you can actually do that here too. But it's exactly the same bug that I'm talking about that you're getting at. Okay. All right. So again, uh, I need to show you a different extension theorem. But of course, I want to explain to you what went wrong with the previous one. Okay. Where's the subtlety? So for this, I need to distinguish between what I'm going to call private and public baseline strategies. Remember the order of quantifiers in these smoothness bounds. For every valuation profile V, you can choose baseline strategies B star so that for every bid vector B, something is true. Okay? So the rub is always how do you choose these B stars? Now, in the first price auction, how did we do it? We just said bid half your value. Okay? Bid or I. Okay? This is a private baseline strategy in the sense that player I only needs to know its own valuation VI to execute this baseline strategy. It does not need to know V minus I. Okay? In other words, B star is independent of V minus I. Okay? So that's what I'm calling a private baseline strategy. On the other hand, if you think about that paradigm, fix V, choose B star for all B, in that paradigm, you're free to choose B star as a function of the full valuation profile V. And actually, in simultaneous first price auctions, that's exactly what we did. What were our baseline strategies? Fix the valuation profile. Bid half of your value on the good you get in opt. What is opt? Opt is the max welfare solution of bipartite matching. Okay? You do not know what opt is unless you know the full valuation profile. Okay? If you only know your valuation VI, you have no idea what opt is. Okay? So the baseline strategy I gave you in the composition theorem is not private baseline. Okay? That is not well defined unless the agent is aware of the full valuation profile V. Okay? It's a function of V minus I also. Okay? So is the distinction clear? So moving forward, it's going to be that private baseline strategies give you Bayes Nash guarantees for arbitrary correlated distributions. Public baseline strategies will give you guarantees only for product distributions. Okay? That's how it's going to play out. So in the single item option, yeah. you didn't care about private versus. Uh, I didn't. I didn't make these definitions at that point. Not relevant for the extension theory. Well, I mean, you always would prefer private baseline strategies, and it just so happened in the first price auctions you could get them. Okay. For first price, but I think your extension theory was general for like uh, any option that's smooth. So that's where I'm going next, right? So let's look at the extension theorem again. Right? That's exactly what I want to show you, okay? So this is just a definition, okay? And uh, it is clear that, you know, somehow this is only harder to do than this, right? So this is a smaller design space you're working in to choose for the B stars. But, but Koss is asking exactly the right question, which is like, well, why didn't that like trivial proof with all the expectations? Why didn't it just go through even with, you know, just these public baselines? So I want to show you that. That's important. Especially because I sort of glossed over this proof, okay? So well, what happens when you prove these extension theorems? At some point, you have to invoke the equilibrium hypothesis, okay? You basically say, look, if the player switched to its baseline, it would only get worse, okay? Now, in an incomplete information game, when a player contemplates what else it might do, what does it know, okay? It knew the prior distribution from the beginning, okay? And it's ex interim. It's learned its own valuation. But in a game of incomplete information, like an auction, at the time a player acts, it does not know V minus I. Okay? It knows a distribution over V minus I, and it knows the bidding strategies used by those players. It does not know V minus I. Okay? So it would not make sense to say, in this derivation, it would not make, so it only makes sense to say um, player I switches to its baseline strategy if the baseline strategy is private because it only knows VI. It, it is not well defined to say switch to your public baseline strategy and invoke the equilibrium condition. Okay, it doesn't make sense mathematically. Okay. So that's where it breaks. 
Okay. On the other hand, I hope you see if it is a private baseline strategy, if it depends only on VI, this proof is correct, okay? Just because this is well defined, okay? You can really talk about switching to your private baseline strategy in the interim stage, all right? Okay, great. So this is kind of the most subtle thing I have to say over these, these couple of days. All right, so again, to summarize, the old extension theorem, it works, it's very, you know, it's, the, it's exactly what you want, arbitrary correlated distributions. It works whenever you have private baseline strategies. In first price auctions, you do indeed have private baseline strategies. Okay, so you definitely do get correlated uh, price of energy bounds for the single item case. Right, so this is the new, this is the really properly phrased extension theorem for the correlated case. Now, what about simultaneous first price auctions, where we have these public baseline strategies that depend on the full valuation profile, okay? So now we need a new extension theorem, right? The old one we know is broken. We have a counterexample. So the old one just cannot be extended. So we need to strengthen the hypothesis. So, you know, we're, we're sort of weakening the condition in that now the baseline strategies are public, not private. We're going to get a weaker conclusion uh, which is that the guarantee will hold only for product valuation distributions. And this theorem you now have to reproof from scratch. Okay, so this is, this is really a distinct result from anything I've, I've showed you so far in these talks, but it can be proved. Let me just tell you kind of like the idea from 30,000 feet, okay? So what went wrong in the previous extension theorem? Well, we want to say in this line, we want to say, well, you know, why doesn't the player switch to its baseline strategy, okay? And if, it, and if it's private, that's fine. You can just think about it switching to its private baseline strategy. If it's public, the reason we can't do this is because the bidder I does not know other people's valuations, does not know V minus I. Its public uh, baseline strategy is not well defined. On the other hand, bidder I does know, it's always known, a distribution from which V minus I is drawn. It doesn't know the realization. It knows the realization of its own type. It doesn't know the realization of V minus I, but it has a distribution. So if you have a distribution and you need a realization, what should you do? You take a sample, okay? And this was a really nice idea of Chris Tudelou, Kovacs, and Shapira. So what you do is, and, and so it, again, it doesn't make sense to say, think about the player switching to its public baseline strategy. So instead, you think about a randomized deviation. You think about the player sampling fictitious valuations for the rest of the players, call them W minus I. And then now that it knows its own valuation and it has hypothesized fictitious valuations for everyone else, now the public baseline strategy is well-defined and that gives it an action that it can take, okay? And it's not at all obvious, but this works, okay? So this is what you do. In the part of the proof where you invoke the equilibrium condition, you sample types for everybody else, that gives you a well-defined baseline strategy and then you reason about the player's utility if it followed that randomized strategy. Yeah. So Nicole. It's not at all clear. I mean, we, we, we sort of know it because there's a counterexample, and we, so we know it has to come into the proof. Nothing I've said verbally indicates where it shows up in the proof. And frankly, it's tricky. Okay, this, this proof, I think, is actually pretty tricky. All right? It's not that long, but it, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, I, think it's, I think it's a really nice, tricky proof. Jeff? Yeah. Give a lambda works uniformly, but it was Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. So this puts it all together. So this, so what, the representative uh, result that I, uh, you know, gave out at the beginning of the first talk was now basically something we've proved. Okay. So yeah, I only gave you the derivation of the fifty percent. I didn't give you the optimized sixty-three percent. But you know, again, that's a that's a you know a good homework problem. Uh, I only proved it for unit demand valuations, where I stated it for submodular valuations at the beginning. But that's really just you know one extra lemma, okay, short lemma, okay. So really, you've basically, seen that entire proof, all right. And again, what I think is so amazing, like if you look at the game-specific work that had to be done, it was a couple lines, okay. It was that one half of the first price auction. Everything else is black box applications of composition and extension theorems. Okay? So uh, for the composition theorem. Yep. You mentioned the unit demand version. Yeah. Uh, is this what we should keep? Now? So, like, uh, what changes? For sure. Modular? Yeah. I, I, I'll, let me quickly say how it works. Um, so we just need to define baseline. We have to define baseline strategies, right? So obviously, if you're not unit demand, you can again say, think about what I get in OT. But if you're not unit demand, you may get more than one thing. Okay. So. 
you do the natural thing, which is you go all in, in some sense, on, what, on the goods you get in opt, and zero on everything else. Now, what do you bid on the goods you get in opt? You kind of want to say like half your value for each. And if you had like an additive valuation, that would make perfect sense. The problem is if you have like a general submodular valuation, it's not, you know, what, what is your sort of, you get these three goods, how do you ascribe to each of them your value just for that good within this bundle? So there you use this trick that every submodular function can be represented as a maximum over additive functions. It turns out, so basically you just sort of look at all uh, ways to order the goods and you look at marginal values and you take the maximum over them and that, that expresses the valuation as the pointwise maximum of additive functions. And so then you look at, so then again, it's all in the proof only, okay? So you look at the goods you get in, at, in opt, you look at a supporting additive valuation, that gives you a number for each of the goods and you bid half of that number on each of those goods. It breaks down at XOS. It breaks down at XOS. And there's a result for subadditive, which I'll mention. Yeah, or fractionally subadditive valuations. There's a result for subadditive which is direct and bypasses all this machinery, which I'll mention it. I'll talk about it. Yeah. yeah. So I know there's a reason for the paper which can't get the same result by LP duality. Yes. Do you have something to say about it? Uh, I, right. Uh, it's an open question, the extent to which it's related. I think it's a really cool paper. Um, this is, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the authors. So, I, um, isn't it? Uh, say it again? Yeah. Cooker irony. Are you on it or? You know, no, no, okay. Yeah, so it's, it's, I mean, the thing I really like about this paper is they really show, I mean, there's some other results recently that have also been, okay, there's a couple papers recently that have basically harnessed the technology of approximation algorithms, which of course at this point is very, very, very mature, and showed how to basically translate approximation algorithm guarantees into price of anarchy guarantees. So there's this paper in SOTA, and then there's another paper by uh, Dudding, Kesselheim, and Tardosh in EC for LP rounding papers. The SOTA paper is more kind of primal dual algorithms. And it sure looks like there should be some connections, uh, maybe not that strong, but at least weak connections to all this smoothness notions, but I don't know what they are. And I, I've talked to those authors about them, and we all agree it's an intriguing open question. So I encourage you to work on it. So. <laughs> yeah, no, I'd love, to know, I'd love to know what's going on. I really don't know what's going on with that. Thanks for the question. Other questions? Okay. So from, uh, for the last part, I want to talk a little bit about lower bounds, okay? So as an analyst, how do you know when you're done? How do you know when you have an optimal bound? Or as a designer, how do you know you should give up looking for better mechanisms versus when should you try to find smarter formats? So. Let me motivate this discussion by, so Casas was just alluding to this result. So let me tell you one example. There's lots of examples where we know tight bounds of the price of anarchy. But let me mention one which is going to be good for my narrative. We're going to stick with simultaneous first price auctions. When I write S1A, I mean simultaneous first price auctions. But I'm going to look at more general valuation classes than we were in the previous part. Okay, so we were looking at unit demand. I mentioned it extended to submodular. And... Uh, Let's actually, just for fun, think about subadditive valuations, okay? So basically, the sum of your value for two different bundles is at least your value for the union of those two bundles, okay? This is pretty much the most general notion of complement-free valuations you might work with, okay? So it certainly doesn't capture everything. It, doesn't, it sort of excludes complements, but subject to excluding complements, it's, it's about as general as it gets. We know exactly what the worst case price of anarchy of simultaneous first price auctions are with, sub with subadditive bidder valuations. It's exactly two. Okay. And there's one paper that has the upper bound. There's one paper that has the lower bound. Both of these papers are really, really cool. Okay. So the upper bounds in Feldman, Fool, Gravin, and Lucier. What's one thing that's really cool about the upper bound is it was known that smooth, this is one of those rare cases where smoothness is not a sharp, not sharp enough tool to prove the optimal bound. Okay. So smoothness gets stuck uh, at logarithmic in the number of items. Okay. That's an old result of Chipper, Bowalker, and I. So, and you basically can't do better than log M using the standard smoothness type arguments. So Feldman and all devise a way to, in effect, choose what I've been calling baseline strategies, but they prove them specifically and separately for each of the Bayes-Nash equilibria. Okay, and that was verboten in everything I was saying. Remember, you choose B star, then something has to be true for all B. So they reverse those quantifiers. So for each equilibrium B, they figure out the right B star, and they can still push uh, everything through. 
Okay, so that's the upper bound, which is very cool. Uh, the lower bound by Christoud Lukovac's uh, Skritza and Tang uh, is just really impressive, okay, because these are complex games and they devise. Um, you know, I'm just going to put a figure here of some of the gadgets in their ingenious construction. So they really exhibit distributions over some added valuations and solve for a bad equilibrium until you can really be off by a factor of two. Okay? So this is also just sort of a tour de force. And, you know, historically, this is how price of anarchy lower bounds have been proved. Okay? You just, like, write down the game, write down the bad equilibrium in the game. Okay? And usually this is hard, explicit constructions. Okay? And, but it has been done successfully in a number of cases. This question? So in the equilibrium, do we assume that the bidders must provide a bid consistent with the class of valuations you're assuming? Uh, it's not even totally clear what that means, given the sort of massive compression on the message space. Right? I mean, you basically, I'm basically forcing you to bid an additive valuation in a simultaneous first price auction. I right, so I could rationalize any bid vector, if you like, is one way to think about it. For all I know, you have an additive valuation. So, the, so here's a here's a so lower bounds historically have been proven by explicit constructions, which are difficult. And so, what I want to advocate in this last part is instead standing on the shoulders of complexity theory, which has a very rich lower bound technique, and from it deducing lower bounds automatically on the price of anarchy, okay, without having to do any kind of explicit construction. The other reason this is going to be really interesting is it'll actually allow us to make optimality statements. For example. Suppose you want a simple mechanism for selling multiple items for bidders with sub-added evaluations. Can you do better than a factor of two? The lower bound shows you can't do better than a factor of two with simultaneous first price auctions. To do better, you'd have to change the auction format. Maybe, but maybe you can be smarter, have a lower price of anarchy. So we'll be able to actually say, mathematically, you cannot do better than a factor two, no matter what simple mechanism you use. Okay, so in this sense, simultaneous first price auctions for the worst case price of anarchy criterion are optimal amongst all simple mechanisms. In a sense, I'll define precisely. Okay? So that's why we're doing this. All right. So the goal of the main result of this fourth part is to say that equilibria are generally bound by the same limitations as computationally efficient algorithms. Okay? This is not an obvious statement because equilibria are not algorithms. Okay? They're just mathematical objects. Okay? So it's not obvious that sort of the laws of polynomial time computation, you know, it's not clear to what extent those, those apply to them. But it's going to turn out that the types of lower bounds that we typically prove in computational communication complexity are somehow strong enough that equilibria, even when not polynomial time computable, still can't dodge those lower bounds. So it's going to be a very general result. The, the assumptions which are important and necessary is that it refers to equilibrium concepts which are guaranteed to exist. Okay, so you want to think about like mixed Nash equilibria and generalizations. And it should be the case that the equilibrium is efficiently verifiable. So notice the, the hypothesis is not that the equilibrium is efficiently computable. That is not required. But if someone hands you an alleged equilibrium on a silver platter, you should at least be able to recognize it as such in polynomial time. Okay? That's also going to be important. All right. So here's the formal statement, and this is a mouthful. Uh, yeah? Uh, yes. Yeah, so the statement's actually about epsilon. The statement's about epsilon equilibria for epsilon extremely small. So yeah, so the real, that's how I sort of dodge the real number issue, basically. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Okay, so I'm going to put this up there. If you don't know what some of these words mean, that's fine. Okay, let me just tell you how to interpret what this is saying. This, so this is the formal statement, but let me just tell you what the takeaway is. The main takeaway is this last point, okay? You want to prove lower bounds on the price of anarchy, on equilibria. So this is a theorem which is going to say, well, if you want lower bounds on equilibria, all you have to do is prove lower bounds on an optimization problem, okay? on something which has nothing to do with game theory. You just have to prove that some optimization problem is hard in a suitable computational model. Okay? So it absolves you from, for example, having to solve any game for an equilibrium. And that's always a good thing, right? Like the whole price of anarchy machinery, you know, on the upper bound side, the whole point was to be able to reason about situations where it's in, sort of incomprehensible in to think about solving for equilibria. Now we want to do the same on the lower bound side, okay? And so that's what this does. Okay? Forget about the game. Just look at the underlying optimization problem, prove a hardness result. 
Okay, so now, again, reading the slide from bottom to front. So what's the formal, so there's gonna be some hardness assumption. Don't worry about it too much. Alpha is just the approximation hardness and the assumption. And then what you get is that for every possible, so, okay, sorry, so fix some valuation class, like subadditive valuations, okay? And suppose welfare maximization is hard for subadditive valuations for some factor at half, for some fa factor alpha, like a factor two. The conclusion says, for every possible simple mechanism, Okay, and I'll say what that means in a second. But for every si possible simple mechanism, not just simultaneous first price auctions, but literally anything else you could do, every possible simple mechanism will suffer from bad equilibria. How bad? The lower bound alpha is the same as the lower bound in the hardness of approximation assumption. Okay? So for example, if you can prove something like you can't do better than a two approximation for the optimization problem, you get that no simple mechanism has a price of anarchy better than two. Okay? So it translates an impossibility result for algorithms to an impossibility result for equilibria of mechanisms. Okay, that's the point. So what do I mean by simple? Simple is just counting the number of actions available to every player. Okay? So, remember there's, you got, so remember there's M items. Okay? Uh, and so what would a direct revelation mechanism be, like VCG? Well, I have to get two to the M numbers from each bidder. Okay, so there's two to the n parameters. So if I want to count actions, that's like doubly exponential in m. Okay, so for example, I could be either zero or one for each of the two to the m bundles, two to the two to the m. So simple here just says it's not direct revelation, basically. Okay, it just says look with a, with a doubly exponential number of actions, you could run VCG. Okay, you'd be great. You'd be full welfare. If you have anything less than a doubly exponential number of actions, then the price of anarchy must suddenly jump to whatever the approximation hardness is for the underlying optimization problem, okay? So that's what simple means, sub w exponential number of actions per player. Simultaneous first price auctions, right? You only have m bidding parameters. So at least if we discretize the bids, there's a singly exponential number of actions per player in a simultaneous first price auction, okay? So this says I give you massively more actions than a simultaneous first price auction. I let you use them however you want, be as clever as you want. Still, you cannot escape this alpha factor from the underlying hardness result. Okay. All right, so let me give you some interpretations, right? So again, this wouldn't be interesting, all right, so it reduces lower bounds for equilibria to lower bounds for algorithms. This wouldn't be useful unless we had lower bounds for algorithms, okay? But a, hu like a, a huge community has been working on lower bounds for algorithms for a very long time, and we know a tremendous amount. So for example, taking that theorem on the last slide and combining it with known lower bounds for algorithms due to Nissan Segal or Dobzinski, Nissan Shapira, we can find the following, okay? So when the class of allowable valuations is subadditive valuations, it's been known about, since about 10 years ago that you can't approximate welfare maximization efficiently better than a factor two, okay, for subadditive valuations. So alpha on the last slide in the hypothesis was two. What does the theorem on the last slide then give us? It says that every simple auction, again, sub doubly, doubly exponential number of actions, has to have a price of anarchy of two or worse, okay? Now recall we had this upper bound for simultaneous first price auctions, and that upper bound was two, okay? And that was you know, a, a simple auction, exponential number of actions. So in this formal sense, simultaneous first price auctions are the optimal simple mechanism for bidders with subadditive valuations. Again, where our performance criterion is the worst case price of anarchy, okay? There's no simple auction which is better than a factor two. If you look at general valuations, then it's known that the welfare maximization problem is totally intractable, okay? You can't even get a 1% approximation. So applying the theorem on the previous slide says that every single simple mechanism, okay, meaning basically not direct revelation, uh, has terrible welfare at a worst case equilibrium, okay? So in particular, you know, there's been a lot of discussion in the commercial auction world about, you know, do commercial auctions have to be complex or not? So for example, something a lot of blood and ink has been spilt over is package bidding, okay? Should you allow bidders to be able to endogenously propose packages, okay? Say, I want, you know, licenses 3, 7, 12, and 15, and here's what I'm willing to pay for all of them. Or should you disallow package bidding or only allow very restricted package bidding? There's been a lot, big discussion about that. So an interpretation here, and you know, one of the one, you know, one school of thought says, well, you know, if you have severe complementarities, you have no option but to have package bidding in complex auction formats. And this is a theorem which really translates directly to that rule of thumb. 
right? So if you have general valuations, meaning you have complements, then what this says is without an extremely large action space, it's totally hopeless to have good welfare guarantees. This is a, a formal way of saying complexity is essential when bidders have complementarity, when items have complementarities. Oops. Do it again. Do it again. Ah, good call. Okay, so questions about that? Yeah. In previous slide, yeah. Is, uh, is this for general them or just for option? Yeah, it's, 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 it's very general. Um, so there's some very mild assumptions required, but it's really not about auctions. Really what, I mean, so you can, you, I mean, so if you, if you look at the paper, it's, it's phrased pretty generally. So basically you just have a notion of a game. You get, sorry, you have a notion of an optimization problem, and then you have a notion of a game built on top of an optimization problem in the sense that any game outcome gets mapped to some solution to an optimization problem. And so the general version of the theorem says whatever the hardness of the underlying optimization problem is, that becomes a lower bound on a game defined on that optimization problem. So for example, you know, I'm talking about these simple auctions. The underlying optimization problem there is welfare maximization. Okay, the question is just given valuations, how close can you get to the maximum possible welfare? Any simple auction or any auction period you can think of as a game built on top of that optimization problem in the sense that you know, once bidders act and some allocation is decided upon, there is some welfare. Okay, so an outcome in particular, an equilibrium of the game gives you uh, a, a feasible solution to the optimization problem. And, you know, if you, and so what this is saying is if you know polynomial time algorithms or polynomial communication protocols can't do a good job at optimizing welfare, then in fact, uh, you know, simple mechanisms also at equilibrium cannot do a good job of optimizing welfare. And again, the reason this isn't trivial is because equilibria are not in general polynom polynomial time computable. If they were, then this would be, you know, have no content. Okay, but in general, they're more powerful than algorithms. Yeah. So for the hypothesis of the theorem, yeah. is there, uh, how many parties uh, are in the communication model? Um, so that varies with the setting. Um, so for these, I mean, here it's whatever, right? I mean, so this is agnostic, this theorem. Uh, for the Nissan, so Nissan and Seagal, they use, uh, let me think, four, for this one, it's not, you, you can have large players or small players, and you get negative results either way. Um, here, I forget if you need, you may need many players to get this to approach two, forget yeah. So I was going to say, to approach two, you need many players, yeah. but for two players, there's a different constant you get that's not just... The... Yeah, it's going to be three halves or something, or yeah, four thirds or something, yeah. yeah. So to get to two, you need the number of players to grow. Thanks, Matt. Okay, and so, you know, so as far as the takeaway here, you know, this stuff uh, I don't necessarily want you to care about, so I just want you to remember this. Okay, the fact that there is a method, there are general theorems, which take as input lower bounds for algorithms and give as output lower bounds for equilibria. Why is this cool? There's two reasons this is cool. First of all, it absolves you from having to figure out a bad game and solve for an equilibrium in a bad game. Okay, solving for equilibrium, especially in complex games, anything you can do to avoid having to solve for an equilibrium in a big game, just you want to do. Okay, so this absolves you from the explicit construction. But then also, you know, we have these explicit constructions, say, for simultaneous first price auctions, you know, but if I tweak the auction format, you know, all of a sudden, you know, I have to, from scratch, potentially, you have to come up with a new bad equilibrium, maybe even a new game, if I vary the auction format a little bit. So I'd have to redo the explicit construction format by format, whereas from these hardness results, you get sweeping lower bounds that apply to literally any mechanism, in this case, any simple mechanism, with not too many actions. Okay, so those are the two reasons uh, why I think you might want to care about this. Sometimes it's hard to find a large equilibrium. So, but um, uh, or sometimes the POA is not good. But there is some approach to 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 approximate the optimal value efficiently, right? So, but the claim is not an if and only if, if that's what you're asking. I mean, the price of energy might be still worse than the lower bound provided by these kinds of theorems, right? Or was that not the question? So it's one direction only, right? So the price of anarchy can't be any better 
than the in approximability result for the optimization problem. It could be worse. And there are plenty of examples where it is worse. And to double check, so the communication model here is uh, like a private baseline. It's like private uh, information kind of stuff. I, I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. Right. So, so I mean, it, it, uh, you have uh, basically you have bidders with private valuations. I mean, that's what I think about it. I mean, it's it's the communication model that exactly is the one you'd want to use, given that what you're trying to model is bidders with private valuations who don't know each other's valuations. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. How about double auctions uh, that would run simultaneously and would just run until they converge towards an equilibrium? Would they count as? Simple mechanisms in, in, in your sense, because you could resell the stuff that you bought on eBay on eBay if you uh, only have. A well, so to, so how do you want to model it? I mean, so this this refers to anything which where the no, the action space is not really really big. So so it kind of so so this is really about mechanisms where the type space is small compared or you know somewhat small compared to the to the type space. Um, so if you're referring to a mechanism that also has that property, then these lower bounds should still hold. Yeah, just like exchanges running in parallel for each of the goods. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, the, there's this delicate question of exactly how, you know, what is the action set? And I can imagine different ways of defining that. And if you have like an infinite horizon, maybe you have an infinite number of strategies. And then it doesn't quite match up. I suspect you could still repair it by saying, oh, well, after a small number of time steps, you have an approximate equilibrium, and then this still applies. But at least, as stated, it needs the, you need some kind of control in the number of actions. Yeah. Yes. So is it important that the number, is it really about the number of actions or about the amount of communication that happens in the mechanism? Maybe well, so, so here's what's really going on. What's really going on is through taking an action, uh, think of an action as basically communicating log, you know, of the number of actions about you, right? So if you have lots of actions, then a single action can communicate a lot, right? So somehow in the reduction, in the proof of this theorem, that's the mapping that happens. If you look at something like a double action where it actually responds to what other agents are doing, yeah. then there, I mean, my ah. strategy space is huge, but I don't actually signal that in. That's an excellent point, right. So that would, that would, be, that would be nice. So that would be, this, the, this proof is uh, too blunt to capture that kind of idea. But I think it does seem like you, one should be able to do something like that, and that would be cool. So wrapping up, okay. So let me just wrap up, I guess, with a few open questions. Uh, so again, the, the whole point of these talks was to kind of, you know, encourage you to prove more theorems in the area. And in particular, there's, I think, some really user-friendly theorems which you can now build on, on both the upper bound side and the lower bound side. But there's all kinds of fundamental stuff we don't know. I mentioned multiple times, even for a you know, single item, first price auction, independent valuations, we don't know what the worst case welfare loss can be at a base Nash equilibrium. It's a little embarrassing. Okay? We don't know the answer. We just know bounds. Uh, one really intriguing concrete open question concerns simultaneous first price auction, or concerns, sorry, uh, simple auctions for bidders with submodular valuations. Okay? So my representative result at the very beginning of yesterday gave a bound of 63%. Okay? So we know that simultaneous first price auctions get 63%. The same lower bound paper I mentioned earlier, Chris Tudelow et al. show that for the specific format of simultaneous first price auctions, this analysis is tight. Okay, so 63% is the correct answer for the specific format of simultaneous first price auctions. But of course, you gotta wonder, can we do better? Maybe a different auction format will get us closer to full efficiency. We don't know the answer to this question, okay? And what we do know is that no simple mechanism can get better than 77%. Okay, this follows from the theorem I just mentioned, plus known communication lower bounds. Uh, it's also known that the lower bound framework that I presented to you today will be incapable of proving that 63 is optimal. Okay, and that's because if you just look at communication protocols, you can do just ever so slightly better than 63%. Okay? So the upshot being is nailing the optimal simple auction for submodular valuations would require either at least one of the following two things, a novel auction format, to get an upper bound better than simultaneous first price auctions, and or a novel lower bound uh, framework that proves lower bounds better than what's true for the underlying optimization problem. Okay, so really love to see progress on that problem. 
more generally, you know, I think now, now understanding that the lower bounds for algorithms, you know, are going to govern what any mechanism could achieve, that sort of draws a line on the sand. Okay, so it really says, okay, as we think about, you know, different kinds of auction formats, if we want to not just analyze existing formats, but think about, you know, how might we tweak them to make them better, you know, in some sense, if you're the kind of person that likes, you know, trying to optimize bounds and get them as good as possible, we now know where we want to get to, right? We want to get to the hardness result for the underlying computational communication problem. So that's all for me. Thanks very much. Jason. Is it possible that your lower bound algorithms method could help with one? With? Hard to see how, because the underlying optimization problem is not hard. So. Do you have any idea of, I mean, so the challenge of showing tighter lower bounds for one yeah. is you have to put your hands on equilibrium in a setting where it's really hard to put your hands on equilibrium. Yep. I would say, so at the moment, we have literally no general tools for proving lower bounds stronger than those apply uh, the, that what comes from the optimization problem. So any such tool of any type would be very valuable. So pretty much if, at the moment, if we want to prove a lower bound in any setting where the optimization problem is easy, we're back to the Stone Age, where you've got to do an explicit construction and solve for a bad equilibrium. Obviously, it'd be great to have new methodology there. That would be, that'd be an awesome result. Reduction for lower bounds for price of anarchy work for price of anarchy for auction revenue as well? Um, let me think. So, what's your. Where you're. You're, what's, so what's the optimization problem? You want to redefine the optimization problem also as being revenue maximization? I'm not sure what your proof is for the reduction. So. Uh, it's a good question. I've never thought about that. Um, yes. Yes. Something similar would be true. So you'd, you'd, I mean, you'd be talking about something which I don't think has been studied well at all, which is basically, so now you'd be talking about probably Bayes-Nash equilibrium analysis. So here, these lower bounds are even for full information. Okay, so, so, but for revenue, presumably you'd be talking about Bayes-Nash equilibrium analysis. You'd now have to be talking about the optimization problem, which is not, you know, here, here the optimization problem was ex post welfare maximization. For what you're saying, it would be, um, uh, you know, Bayesian, the Bayesian revenue max, maximizing auctions revenue. And you'd have to think about the computability and approximability of that problem, um, which, you know, it has been studied a little bit, but not a lot, I don't think. But, in, but, but otherwise, it should translate. So if you had negative results for computing the optimal expected revenue, that should actually translate into something for price of energy guarantees for simple auctions, I think. Yeah, good question. Yeah. So uh, you had a question earlier. Um, it's sort of on the technical side, but the uh, subparity result, yeah. can you prove it? If, so there is a sort of like a specific technique that works for, I don't know, Feldman et al. Yes. Can you prove it via an extension theorem? Can you prove it? Say it again? Via an extension theorem that you have for XOS, for example? There is no known way of doing it. And the straightforward way of trying gets stuck at log m. So I don't, I don't totally know how to prove a theorem that says no conceivable smoothness type argument. It could be doable, but I don't know how to formalize that statement. Um, but so certainly in their upper bound, they crucially use the selection of these baseline strategies for deviation in an equilibrium dependent way. So they look at the equilibrium, they say for this equilibrium to say this particular equilibrium is good, we're going to use these particular deviations. And the deviations depend on the equilibrium. And it's very clever how they use it. And it seems, it seems very hard to know how you'd recapture their factor two without an equally clever idea. But I don't know. Yeah. So if one could turn the Feldman et al. upper bound into some kind of more general extension theorem, it'd be super cool. I'm not sure but, uh, that that's possible, but it'd be really nice. It's Sorry if I missed this, but yesterday you talked a lot about even if you can't find equilibria, you have these bounds even for no regret solutions. Right. Uh, how did that 
work with today's result? Right. So, so it's a good question. So somehow, this, so the so here this would really be immediate. I mean, this would be basically trivial if. Um, the lower, you know, if I just wanted to say that worst case, no regret equilibria can't be very good because those are polytime computable, right? So, so, you know, if you have an equilibrium, once you can then just compute yourself in polynomial time, then it's clear that that is a polynomial time algorithm and so it has to obey all these lower bounds. So the technical point here is saying that, you know, even for, and a lot of the, frankly, a lot of the price of energy analyses, it's interesting. I mean, so you can actually just study price of energy bounds and complexity of equilibria sort of totally separately. I mean, they're both super interesting, they're both really important, but progress on one doesn't seem to depend on the other at all. So a lot of this price of energy machinery remains valid, even if the equilibria are kind of hard to compute. And of course, then there's always this worry. It's like, oh, okay, if, you know, why, why should, you know, why can't they just get optimal? Why can't equilibria just be optimal if, I, if, you know, if they're like super hard to compute? And so this all says, no, 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 they're really, for optimization purposes, you know, they're stuck in the same place that algorithms are stuck. Now, of course, once you switch back to the upper bound side, right, you're, you're hoping to prove upper bounds, which are not just for maybe mixed Nash equilibria, but for no regret learners and so on, right? So, so here on the lower bound side, we wanted to kind of use the hardest equilibrium concepts, on the upper bound side, we want to use the easiest equilibrium concepts. Yeah, good question. Okay, I think we should take more questions to the break, and let's start the speed talks at 3.40, so.